Okay, so uh, take it away. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Marco. Um, and welcome everybody uh, who is here and on time <laughs> for our presentation today. Uh, my name is Alfredo Moros and I am the representative for Seneca College um, located in Toronto, Canada. And I'm here with my colleague Alona from Jacksonville University in Jacksonville, Florida, who will um, also be presenting today. I don't know if Alona, if you wanna say hi to the group. Absolutely. Hi, everybody. Pleasure to be here in your company. Awesome. Um, so today, Ilona and I will be talking about um, Canadian and U.S. admissions information. We will be talking a little bit about kind of uh, general admissions information when it comes to the two education systems, uh, when it comes to post-secondary education. Um, but we will also be touching a little bit about um, or a little bit of information about our own uh, institutions uh, in terms of what are the specific requirements that we'll be asking you to submit to us in order to apply to uh, either Seneca College or Jacksonville University. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to do uh, today was kind of have a little bit of an overview of what the Canadian education system is like, because um, it does have some key differences with the US system that you will be able to compare later on when Alona uh, speaks to that. Um, but so as you know, Canada is divided into 10 provinces and three territories. And so we have um, two levels of government that play a role when it comes to post-secondary education, in particular for international students. So our federal government um, has jurisdiction of everything that has to do with immigration. So that directly impacts um, international students' ability to get a study permit, to be able to work while they study and eventually um, remain in Canada with a work permit uh, to be on the path towards permanent residence. Um, the federal government also regulates and oversees um, which institutions, whether they're public or private, are able to actually admit international students. Um, and you'll hear me talking about um, designated learning institutions or DLIs. And this is really important for all of you listening today um, that are international students to know because you will find during your research that Canada has a lot of private co career colleges um, that offer different sort of programs uh, in some public institutions as well that don't have a DLI number. And if any institution in Canada doesn't have that number, it means that they cannot legally admit you into their programs. So when you're doing your research and you're looking at your different options, make sure that um, you look at the immigration website and you find the DLI list, which by a simple Google search you can find um, and confirm that your institution of interest is actually on that list. Um, an important thing to note though, that even though there is this oversight from the federal government, the um, education system is primarily at the provincial level. That means that we don't have a federal secretariat of education. We um, actually have multiple ministries of education or advanced education through um, in every single province uh, that kind of oversees everything that has to do with curriculum development, um, that approves or um, disqualifies programs from being able to operate within the province. And it also provides funding to public institutions. So many programs that you'll see at Seneca um, have, um, will admit both Canadian and international students. And the pricing of those programs vary precisely because of the funding that comes from pro the provincial government is meant to uh, subsidize education for Canadian citizens and residents. And that will be kind of one of the main differences that you'll see um, when you're looking at cost options. Um, it also, the provincial government also regulates and oversees the operation of all uh, um, education uh, institutions or schools, whether they're public or private and what, at whatever level that may be. So any sort of public or a private post-secondary institution that operates in Ontario needs to have accreditation by the Ministry of Advanced Education and Training from our province. Um, now in the, uh, each province, as I mentioned, uh, they will manage and uh, deal with their any sort of education matter, however they decide. Some provinces will work very closely with post-secondary educations in providing support um, while others kind of provide more general guidelines. In the case of Ontario, which is where we're located, um, the province actually has what we call the Ontario College Application Service, 
which is a platform that any public institution can choose to use for um, applications from their international students or prospective international students. That means that most Canadian students will use OCAS to apply to any public college or university in Ontario. But for international students, you have to pay attention to the different colleges that you're interested in and see what it is that they do in their particular case. For us at Seneca, we've chosen to do an in-house application. That means that you only need to go into our website um, to go and find the application form that you need to fill out, submit the supporting documentation, um, and then apply for admission into Seneca. Whereas some other colleges will allow you to, do, to use the OCAS system um, and uh, apply directly, just as if you were uh, similar to a domestic or Canadian student. Um, there's, of course, pros and cons to both, but Seneca has opted for this to kind of facilitate your um, research in terms of how you find the information to apply it to Seneca, um, and also recognizing that the supporting documents that you provide are quite different to, that, to those that we ask from Canadian students. And so we built a platform that is able to um, recognize those differences and uh, include those in the application process. Um, now, often, whether it's in the US or in Canada, you will often hear the term college or university use interchangeably. Um, and this is particularly true if you haven't yet studied in the US or Canada and don't fully understand the nuances or the differences between the two systems. Um, now, I'm going to speak again very particularly about Canada, and I wanted to uh, pinpoint some of the main differences between the two types of institutions so that you already know, um, you know, based on this, what sort of um, institution type you might be looking for. Um, there's five main areas in which we can uh, look at differences for these institutions. The main, uh, the first one would be program types. So colleges tend to have a wider variety of uh, types of programs that we offer from one year, two year, three year and four year programs. Um, that will attend to different uh, labor market needs. Whereas universities are more traditional that they will offer usually only bachelor's degrees, master's programs and, and doctorates or PhDs. They're, they will usually also have what they call continuing education to get additional certifications, but that's not necessarily one of the main functions of a university. Um, when it comes to intake dates, universities as well um, in Canada tend to only have two intake dates um, and especially for undergrad, it usually is only around September because of the way that the academic year is established uh, in the education system here and the way that programs are offered and the pre-requirements pre to advance into further upper years. Whereas for colleges, we do try to be, be a little bit more nimble, recognizing that folks from around the world will graduate at different times. And so we offer many of our programs uh, up to three times a year, allowing you to start at any point during those intakes. Now, the focus of a college in Canada is very much around job preparation, uh, applied research, innovation, experiential learning. So you will find that um, a lot of our programs will include uh, a work integrated learning component or co-op They will, or uh, an internship component. Um, we will focus a lot on if you're doing any sort of technology program, there will be labs associated to that. Um, so we always want to make sure that you're learning how to do the work so that when you're hitting the ground running, uh, uh, so you're hitting the ground running when you read, uh, reach the labor market in Canada. Whereas in universities, the focus is much more around academic research, knowledge development and innovation. So often, depending on what you want to do with your career, you may find that a college may be better suited uh, in preparing you for the job market than a university. Um, when it comes to the cost, and this is uh, very specific to international students again, um, you'll find that colleges are a much more affordable option uh, to obtain basically the same sort of credentials uh, and experience that you would at a university. If we look, for example, at a bachelor's degree at a college, on average, we're talking about eighteen to twenty-one thousand dollars Canadian for every two academic semesters. Whereas at a university, um, looking at a similar bachelor, it could be, for example, a bachelor of commerce, um, the same program would be costing between twenty to fifty thousand dollars Canadian for every two academic semesters, depending on the institution. So many of our international students have opted to come to Seneca to pursue their bachelor's degree, if, if that's one of the programs that we offer. Um, but for the disciplines where we don't offer bachelor's degree, many of our students decide to do 
either a diploma or an advanced diploma, which is a, a shorter program, and then transfer those credits into a university. So these two types of institutions are not necessarily competing against each other, but they're quite, quite complementary, allowing you to um, transfer credits from one to the other to best match what your, um, your um, academic uh, objectives are. And lastly, and I guess the reason why we're here today uh, is around admissions and what are kind of the main differences there. So um, when it comes to colleges, we are actually uh, have a quite a straightforward admissions process. Um, the, the philosophy of colleges, um, even before we started admitting international students, was to provide access to education. So that means that if in high school you weren't, you know, top of your class, or if you went to university and you failed a few courses, that shouldn't be something that prevents you from accessing education further down the line and continuing to train yourself and improve your education um, for your future. And so you'll find that at Seneca, we do not usually will require uh, any sort of student profile or personal essay. There's no need for recommendation letters or standardized testing. Um, and that's the case uh, at Seneca, but also any public college in Canada. Um, and you, and uh, the, the, the things that we do look at are usually um, that you have finished your last program of study, whether it's high school or university. Uh, we don't even have very high GPA standards because, again, we don't want um, if you had uh, if you didn't have a very positive experience in your prior academic uh, environment, we don't want them to impact your ability to gain access to our programs. Um, you'll also find that the English proficiency uh, levels that we require are not as high as a university. Often universities will use this as a filter um, to uh, prevent students from applying um, and from to deter students that don't have uh, very high scores in a TOEFL or an IELTS from applying. For us, we want to recognize that yes, you do need to have an advanced level of English in order to apply and to succeed in your program, but you don't need to have a perfect score in a standardized English test in order to uh, apply. On top of that, um, there are some exemptions to this rule at both colleges and universities. So if you've already studied uh, in a country where, the, where English is the main, uh, the main language, where the instruction of your uh, courses was always in English, you could be exempt from that. Usually colleges will allow uh, an exemption if you've done that for two years. On the flip side of that, universities will ask either three or four years of full-time studies in English to exempt you from that rule. So again, colleges tend to have just a lower barrier to entry when it comes to admissions processes, really kind of opening the door to any of you that um, perhaps you are looking at universities that are have very, very high standards. Uh, you may want to look at Seneca as a, your first step into Canada into high quality education um, and then look at um, pathways into universities, for example. Um, now, as I mentioned, as I've been talking about and peppering through uh, my chat so far, um, Seneca College of Applied Arts and Technology, we are a public institution accredited by the province of Ontario, as well as being a designated learning institution by the, fed the federal, federal government. We actually have about 9,000 international students and we are one of the largest colleges in the greater Toronto area. Uh, in fact, we're actually Canada's largest business college. Um, we have the most students in our faculty of business. Um, all of our programs are driven by market need and market demand, which also means that we work very, very closely with industry leaders to make sure that what we're teaching you in the classroom is what you'll need by the time that you graduate and so you can hit the ground running. Um, that's why we offer co-ops, work terms, field placements, internships, or applied research projects that you can embed or include within your studies so that you're not only sitting in class and taking in information, but you're also applying it as you're learning in a safe, controlled environment. And that's why um, we have been able to boast about our 85% plus uh, post-graduation employment rate where most of our graduates are able to secure a job within their field of study within the first three months of graduation, um, which is ideal for many of our international students who are also seeking to uh, find themselves on the path towards permanent residence. <clears throat> Now, in terms of uh, the requirements that we asked for, um, very similar to what I was speaking about earlier. Um, now we're just kind of getting into the nitty gritty of the specific documents that you need to be providing. 
Uh, and keep in mind that all of these are documents that you need to have uh, handy in digital version at the time of application, um, which is done online, as I mentioned, uh, through our website. And um, that's kind of the final step of the application. So you fill out the form and then you're able to submit your supporting documents. Um, at Seneca, we have a wide variety of programs, uh, but at the undergraduate level, we have diplomas, advanced diplomas, and bachelor's degrees, two, three, and four years respect, uh, respectfully. So that uh, for those programs, we will um, have the minimum requirement that you have graduated high school. That means that we'll need to see your high school graduation diploma, your transcript from the last two to three years with all of your courses. And if that comes in a language other than English, you'll need to get that uh, translated by a certified translator. Um, if you're currently in your senior year and you know you want to apply to Seneca, so as soon as you graduate, you can join us after, um, you can certainly apply. Uh, obviously, you will not have your graduation diploma and your final transcript at that point, but we can accept a letter on official letterhead and stamped by your school indicating that you're a senior, when is your graduation date, and that you are in fact expected to graduate successfully, and partial transcripts that you have until that point. And that way we can start your admissions process to ensure that you have a conditional offer into Seneca. And once you graduate and are able to submit those final documents to us, we would remove the condition on your offer and you're able to start classes with no problem. Now, when it comes to our graduate certificates, the threshold is a little bit higher. You do need to have a bachelor's degree under your belt, or if you are in Canada and you're currently at a college, um, if you are taking an advanced diploma uh, after finishing that, you are able to access our graduate programs. So, um, for these, you do need to provide us with the graduation diploma and the transcripts of all of the courses that you took, which means that you cannot apply during your last semester. It means that you must have graduated in order to then uh, apply to these uh, graduate certificates. Um, I'll make a quick note that often we get the question uh, about master's programs and if this is the same thing and if, call it, if Seneca offers these. Um, master's programs uh, are you typically offered at universities in Canada, not at colleges, but um, we've seen a growing demand for graduate certificates, especially from employers that are finding that these sorts of programs better prepare our students for the job market than a master's degree that tends to be more theoretical in nature. Um, so also a great opportunity for any of you who are looking some, for some graduate opportunities. Um, in terms of English requirements, um, I'm, what you're seeing on screen are on the kind of the left side column are all the different English language proficiency, proficiency tests that we accept for um, admissions into Seneca. That means that you can take any of those and depending on the type of program that you want to apply to, there will be a minimum score that you need to obtain. Um, during COVID-19, the Duolingo test of English has become extremely popular with our students because IELTS centers and TOEFL centers have been closed. Um, and so that's a great option for any of you who are interested uh, in starting your application process, but you don't have any available testing sites where you are, you can do that from the comfort of your home. Uh, the results are usually quite quick and we're able to admit you um, based on those. Now, as I mentioned as well earlier, there are some exemptions to the rule of having to take one of these tests. And so um, in lieu of having to do this, we will accept the successful completion of minimum of two years of study, a full-time study at a school or institution in a country where English is the primary language, or um, we will also uh, accept you uh, studying English with us and having a conditional offer into your post-secondary program. So Seneca has its own English Language Institute where we offer English uh, language training at the academic level. So if you, let's say, for example, take the Duolingo test for a bachelor's degree and you get under your 115 minimum, based on that Duolingo test, we can let you know how many additional weeks of English you would need to do um, that you can do with Seneca. And you can decide if you want to apply for a conditional offer um, doing English before you start your post-secondary studies or if you would like to retake your Duolingo test or any other test in your own time and reapply with those scores. It's completely up to you. The other exemption to this rule is um, if you are uh, born a citizen of any of these countries and have actually studied in them, then you may also be uh, exempt from these rules. 
Um, so it's uh, if you go to the link that's on the screen, you will be able to kind of see a little bit more in detail um, all of the information that I've just shared in terms of the English requirements. Um, but the last piece that I wanted to show you before um, I pass it on to my colleague uh, is a quick snapshot of what our online application looks like. Um, so going to the link below, which is intl.senecacollege.ca, it'll take you directly into this website. Um, to apply, you just first have to create a Seneca account. Um, and through that account, you'll be able to apply to multiple programs. Um, once you've submitted your application, you'll be able to log back into that account to see the status of your application. And should it be successful, that will also then become your student account where you will register all of your courses, pay for tuition, um, ask for um, uh, advising sessions, et cetera. Um, and so with that, I will pass it on to Ilona. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alfredo. This is, uh, your presentation was great. Um, it's amazing how many areas um, are similar between the US and Canada in terms, especially of the application process and the materials required to get admitted. There are some tweaks and differences that we're going to go over it, but pretty much the process is very much straightforward and similar. And just off to piggyback on uh, your last slide, that username and that password for that um, account you create for your application is vital. Um, and I cannot stress how important it is that you provide a valid email address that you check often in order to stay on top of your applications and connect it with your admissions officers. Um, and what we're doing today is we're actually doing the first step for building for tomorrow. And this is um, why I, I named my presentation Building for Tomorrow because the build for tomorrow starts with one simple step and that's the application process. Um, and once more, my name is Ilona and I'm with Jacksonville University. Um, it, we're located in um, Northeastern um, Florida, uh, sun, the Sunshine State, <laughs> um, where I have been for two years and it's my pleasure. I just wanted to go over the um, overview of my um, presentation and the three main areas that we're going to focus on uh, discussing today. Um, I would like to open up with um, what's called the common app versus the in-house application. Alfredo already touched upon the in-house um, application. Um, in the US, um, we have a great variety, and this is what's great about the US and the Canada educational system that we have great, great plethora and diversity in our um, educational system. So in the US, there is not one body that, well, there is. <laughs> there is one federal body that kind of controls um, all of the post-secondary education in the US, but every school is allowed to uh, create their own unique programs and to have their own unique um, way of, um, of the program as well as the application process. Um, so this is where the common app and the in-house app differences come in. But what I want to touch upon first is what is the common app? So the common app is what it says, it's a common app. So you create one app where you add your information and your materials. Um, and then this app, based on your preferences of what you would like to study at the college um, or graduate level, um, then sends your application to a selected few of their 900 schools that they have on record. So let's say you want to study nursing uh, and you create an application, you submit all of your materials for that one degree you want to study, and then the Common App selects all of their partner schools out of those 19, uh, 900 schools um, to send your application to, or you select which of their partner schools that offer nursing you want your application to be submitted to. The in-house app is rather the opposite. You start off by creating um, what I call research and list of schools, you select, first you start off with the idea of what you want to study, then you research the schools that you'd like to apply, and then you create your app, just like Alfredo said, on the website of the school, you submit your application um, with the supporting materials for your application. And um, both types of applications have uh, pros, 
um, the common app is a one app that you have to create, um, but it provides a limited pool of schools. So not every single school that you're, um, not every single school in the US that offers your degree of preference will be on that list of schools. They have 900 schools on there. California largely do, does not use the common app. So if you are keen on studying California, then going about through the in-house app would be a better process. Why I like the in-house app process better is because all schools in the US tend to offer what's called an application fee waiver code. So even if let's say you're applying to 10 or 20 different schools, you can contact each school individually, acquire their fee waiver code and submit your 20 apps or 10 apps without even paying a dime. So whereas with the common app, you have to uh, submit, I do believe it's like $50 for the application. Another thing about the in-house app that I prefer uh, is that it allows you to do your personal research um, on that particular institution because you go on their website, you look into their program, and then from there decide whether to submit application to the school or not. So um, we'll move to the next slide. Thank you, all right, for doing that. <laughs> um, this is yet another um, overview slide of, of the topic that we're discussing today. Uh, it's the seven major or it's actually eight major steps um, towards completing your um, application. The last step, the awaiting communication is not really part of the <laughs> application process, but for me, it's so important that I listed it. There is an extra step. Um, so I, what I normally advise students to do, and this is what I did in my experience as a student, is I started off my application process with gathering all of my materials, always gathering my, um, degrees, my certificates, um, my proofs of English proficiency, all of the items that Alfredo already discussed. Um, and then from there, moving in into the actual application process. So to go into further detail about the gathering the materials, um, I would start off, like I said, with collecting uh, my my grade record. This is the most important thing that schools in the U.S. look for. It doesn't matter um, whether it's not accompanied by um, an equivalency. Most of the schools in the U.S. are equipped of converting grades from different um, international systems. I know in, in Canada, for example, each state's grading system might vary a little bit from the others. Um, so schools in the U.S. are equipped of converting grades. So for high school, you will never be required to, to have um, a conversion. But if you're applying as a graduate student, then you will need to have your grades equivalated. Um, and um, this will be part of your, of your grade record. Um, then um, I would create a list that with the activities that I have participated in outside of my school life, such as charitable activities or volunteer work, if any. Um, I would collect my test scores. Now, schools in the US, especially nowadays with COVID, tend to switch to what's called the test optional version. So you might not absolutely be required to take the SAT or ACT, depending also on the program for which you are applying. Like, for example, our nursing program at um, Jacksonville University requires either an SAT or an X score for direct admission. But if you have not set for those exams, you still have the option to get admitted in pre-nursing, take a couple of classes and then move into the nursing program. Um, the nursing program is the only one that I can think of. I am part of a um, private university. So um, we are when it comes to the rest of our degrees, we're absolutely test optional. So you're not required to submit an SAT or X score. When it comes to graduate programs, you might be required to sit for a GMAT or LSAT. And this is where researching the schools that you're applying to is very important because even though it might be the two, uh, two degrees in business, um, you know, and both schools might have a business school, the requirements for admission might vary from one school to the other. Um, very important part of your application will also be having your parents and legal guardians information at hand. 
as well as any certificate or honors or achievements that you might have been awarded on the academic level. Why am I saying this? Because we, this is, those types of materials are what creates in the US what we call the student profile. And based on that profile, we can award you in-house scholarships. So it's very important to collect any and all information that you have from your academic history um, because it might grant an additional thousand to two thousand hours on your scholarship, in-house scholarship. Um, <clears throat> and step two, reviewing your college and university list. As I said, it's very vital to do your research. There is over four thousand uh, post-secondary um, post-secondary um, schools in the U.S. So out of all of those 4,000, you have to pick the one that's going to be the best uh, fit for you. It's, I cannot stress how important it is to pick the right school. And it all starts with, you know, having your dreams, knowing what you want to study, and then from there researching the institutions that best fit you and your needs. Um, in the U.S., schools tend to be divided into colleges and universities similar to, to Canada, but there is also state schools and private schools. And private schools tend to be smaller and offer smaller um, classes that even at the undergraduate level, you almost feel like you're in graduate class with like 10 people in your class and the professor, uh, which allows for a very one-on-one -on -one environment. But if you're like me, I prefer state schools because I like the business. I like uh, meeting all kinds of different people. Um, I loved being in, in, in that busy state school. So for myself, I chose the, the public, um, public education. For international students in the US, something that um, I should have touched upon in the opening, for the international students in the US, which um, Canadian students um, are considered to be, uh, at the state level, there might be a difference in tuition when it comes to um, domestic versus international students, but private institutions tend to offer the same tuition for international as for domestic students. Um, so researching that is also um, an important step, um, which type, if you are set, if you have set your mind on studying the U.S., um, it's very vital to um, determine whether you prefer to st to be part of a state or private institution. Um, another thing for Canadian citizens, while Canadian citizens are not required to have um, a full visa to study in the U.S., Canadian citizens are required to have um, what's called an I-20 form um, and a CIVAS record, which is not technically a visa, but it's an immigration record um, which is kept on file for your studies and which allows you to pass the border without having uh, any difficulties. This is what the I-20 form is generally used for. So there is a little bit of an immigration process there, uh, but it's not a full-on visa process. Bless you, Alfredo. Do you mind switching? <laughs> So step three of the U.S. application process. Now you can move those steps whichever way you prefer. This is just my method, how I did it when I was applying to a uh, university is um, to create your application. And why I put it as a step three is that so you would get more familiar with what each school or what the common app would require from you. Uh, and just to keep in mind, there is generally um, five types of applications in, in the U.S. Uh, we have a non-degree seeking application. This is generally for students who want to attend ELP or e ESL programs. Uh, the first time freshman application, which we get the most of, is for students fresh out of high school entering their first year of post-secondary studies. Um, we have also an application for transfer students who are transferring uh, from one post-secondary school or college to another. Let's say you attended um, college in Canada, but you want to get your bachelor's degree from an institution in the U.S., then you'll be considered to be a transfer student. Um, 
And then we have a second degree st um, student application, which is for students who have already completed their bachelor's degree, but they want to go take maybe a second bachelor's degree in a different track. And then there is the graduate student application, which the graduate student application is for both a master's studies and doctoral studies. So both of them fall under the umbrella of, of graduate studies. Um, and as I mentioned already, very important, valid email <laughs> should be used for the application because communication and requests from the school um, will be coming through, through that email. Just make sure that um, the name with which you apply matches the one that's on your school or material records or otherwise indicate that there was a change of name um, at some point or another. So thank you, Freya. Can we move to the next one? I feel like a princess. <laughs> Request and hope it is so helpful. <laughs> um, step four in my uh, academic process was to engage uh, my support team <laughs> or, or in other words, to request recommendation letters or to prep the professors or people that um, um, I was going to request recommendation letters to come from uh, via email or a phone call. And in the US, uh, recommendation letters can be sent by counselor, parents, teachers, advisors, coaches, and poor peers. But, um, um, you know, the, the general thing about um, requesting letters of recommendation is they are not required for admission unless your specific program requires it. Another, um, I'm going to use nursing yet again because nursing is very special since it's part of the medical field. They have much more requirements than the rest of the degrees. So, for example, our nursing program would request three letters of recommendation, but to be admitted generally, um, at state or private school, you're not required to submit recommendation letters unless your specific program requires it. And this is why I, I stress like starting off researching what you want to study in the schools that offer it. So then you can delve into their particular requirements before you even begin the application process. And then, um, then step five is really listing and understanding the requirements. As Alfredo mentioned, in Canada, there is a particular deadline that students need to submit their application by. In the US, that is true, but only for graduate programs. So let's say you want to apply for a PhD in ancient history. <laughs> <laughs> I'm biased. I, <laughs> I got a master's in ancient history, so <laughs> this is why I'm using this example. But let's say you um, you're a, want to apply for a PhD program, then at ten, nine out of 10 times, I want to say 10 out of 10 times, there will be a deadline for that particular application and it will be generally the beginning of December. Uh, but if you're applying uh, as a first time freshman, there is rolling admissions and there is no particular deadline. And um, January the, uh, generally the uh, fall semester in the US starts at the end of um, August, early September. Uh, and the spring semester starts uh, in the very beginning of January. Now with COVID, those days change a little bit, but this is the general time timeline. And then the summer semester starts in May. So you can apply for school at any given time to get admitted for any given semester. Let's say you applied on January 6th, but the spring semester starts um, January 4th, then your application will be reviewed for the summer. Um, then um, application fees. Each school has a different application fee, uh, but as I said, if you get um, connected with the school through the admissions office and request a fee, uh, a fee uh, waiver code, they'll absolutely provide it to you and send it to you. Um, another um, requirement this, that schools might have is a personal essay. At Jacksonville University, we do require a personal essay or what's called a st statement of intent um, or a college essay at different places. Um, we're still going to review our application without it, but we use the personal essay more towards the Merit Aid Scholarship Award. Um, 
another thing to keep in mind is um, when when you're preparing your um, requirements for your program is the courses and grades requirements that this particular program might have. Yet again, I'm going to use nursing. Nursing at Jacksonville University requires you to have seven classes, um, specific, very specific classes uh, to have been taken before you enter the program. All other programs will not have such specific requirement unless it's a graduate program. A graduate program might have um, a specific course requirement. Like for example, for ancient history, when I was applying, they wanted me to have certain amount of Latin and ancient Greek done before I even apply for the program mm -hmm. uh, at the graduate level. But at the undergraduate level, unless it's nursing or medical pro program, there won't, there won't be any specific course requirements. Also, you should get familiar with the test policy of the school. As I said, we're test optional, but there is many schools that require, and by test optional, I mean the US standardized testing system, the SAT and the ACT. For international students who have studied outside of the US and, and Canada or in countries which the official language is not English, there will be uh, TOEFL or Yelts or Duolingo or some type of English proficiency test requirement. Um, if you are applying for studies, uh, let's say in fine arts, such as dancing or vocals or or an instrument, you might be required to submit a portfolio and your, or um, let's say a painting, sculpture, um, then you need to get uh, yourself familiar with the particular program that you're applying to and what their por portfolio requirements might look like. Um, the writing supplements might be um, required, as I said, and recommendation letters. Um, now, another thing to mention about the Common App that it's useful is that they have a tool which lists all of the requirements um, for their partner schools. And um, when it comes to, as I said, we require an essay. Um, and when it comes to sitting down and planning and writing this um, college application essay, I know very students, uh, a lot of students are, are stressing a lot about the essay, how long it should be, what type of information uh, are schools looking to find. And this is why I decided to talk about it a little bit, even though it's not an absolute solid requirement such as the grade record is, um, I still, and especially for graduate programs, um, it's still very important to keep that essay in mind and um, how to structure it and write it. Um, overall, you know, a page would suffice as long as you introduce your reader to who you are as a person, what your background is, what you like to do, and why you have decided, very important. Um, and I always advise students to put that in the conclusion is why you want to study at that particular place. Um, otherwise, I know this requires a little bit of, of customization if you're applying to six or seven different schools. Uh, and this is why keeping it in, in the conclusion is very useful because you can just change, change the conclusion a little bit uh, based on the school and not the entire essay. Uh, but schools are really looking for that. And if you mention the school's name in the essay, the reader of the essay is like, oh my gosh, they have researched us. The student knows why they want to be here. They know what they want to study. That's great. Um, and then another thing I would advise with your application um, and throughout actually gathering your materials, doing your research and like writing your essay is like not doing it all at once. Don't do it like me. I did it all at once for my undergraduate and it was, uh, I, I wish I did it differently, you know. Then when I got to, to the graduate application, I was like, okay, I, I need to sit down, organize everything and proofread it. Proofreading is very important because your application as a whole from providing your information, legal guardian information, materials, um, you know, college essay, test scores, it all represents you. Us as admissions officers cannot see you as a person, but we see your application. And, and this is why it's so important. You want to make sure that it's the most accurate representation of who you are and what you want to do in life. Um, the eight step 
Um, and the final step of, of my presentation is actually the awaiting communication part. And this is why I stress the, the essay, uh, the essay, the email so much and like uh, pro, um, making sure that you provide a valid one is because even though, um, and this is with every application that you can submit to a US institution, even though you can hit the submit button and you think you are done, there might be something in particular that the school might reach out to you about, like for example, national exams. If you have taken IB classes for an IB certificate, if you are doing AP level courses, they might need some additional information for them. So this is why providing a valid email um, that you check often, it's very important. So you can stay on top of your application and not only that, so then you can go back later on and uh, see what the decision on your application is what the decision on your scholarship is, and um, if the school is emailing you with any additional information about outside uh, scholarships or like visit grants that you might be eligible for. So with all of that being said, my rambling is over. <laughs> now we're gonna <laughs> turn the floor to you. <laughs> <laughs> and answer any and all questions you might have. Um, I am by no means the absolute specialist of the US educational system, uh, but um, I'm more than, you know, open to any questions. And if I don't know the answer, I would love to research it for you. I'm sure Alfredo is on the same page. Absolutely. And I just wanted to uh, kind of resonate with your last comment. Uh, it, about emails. It's super important, um, especially in this day and age that you do use an email, uh, that you check regularly. Um, that is the main way that we are all going to be communicating with you. Um, and then at the same time, what Alona mentioned about the personal essay and making sure that you're representing yourself well um, so that the admissions officer can know who you are because ultimately we cannot see you uh, before you arrive on our campus. Um, that also applies to Seneca. And uh, even though we don't ask for a personal essay, um, often we get the question and saying, oh, you know, I went to high school and I took some university courses and I'm interested in an undergrad program. Should I just send you my high school transcript? And the answer should all is um, as a rule of thumb, the more documents or the more su supporting documentation you can send us, the better. It gives us a better idea of what your profile is like, of how suited you are for the program that you're applying for. And it gives you a better um, possibility of being admitted against somebody who perhaps didn't submit as many documents. Um, and so super important that you're always doing the best to give us as much information as possible about yourself so that we can make the best decision about your situation. Yeah, don't ever think, you know, oh, they would never care to look at that. This is our job. Our oh, job we'll look at everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had a student who sent me her drawings. And yeah. I'm not, uh, uh, you know, part of the fine arts school, but it was a pleasure to, to look at them and, you know, just be inspired by them. Exactly. Uh, another thing that I love to do is if a student sends me uh, a really strong essay, um, you know, with uh, personal quotes that they include in there or what motivates them like motivational quotes, mm -hmm. I like copy them bluntly and like put them all over my, <laughs> my cubicle. They're inspirational. I mean, my students inspire me every day. So exactly. it's part of the reason why we do this work for sure. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> um, we have a question from Ailish Mohar um, asking, what is the difference between AP and university level courses and whether they're the same? Same. In the U.S.? In the U.S., yes. In Canada, we, um, we also have AP. It's basically the same thing. Uh, and it basically really depends on the university or college you're looking at and whether the, the, that institution will accept advanced placement courses. Uh, but you will often also find that many universities and colleges in Canada will have what we call dual credit programs with a lot of high schools, whether public or private, across the country. So that means that while you're in your senior year, you can start taking some university level courses that will be recognized both by your high school and the university for your first year of classes or the college. Um, so you have that option as well. The same thing goes for the U.S. And generally what I have seen our registered office do with our Canadian 
uh, applicants is if they have AP level courses, they will recognize them as college level or like entry level courses, uh, especially if they're general. Now, if it's an AP in basket weaving, I don't know about that, if it's something that practical, but if it's like, you know, as, uh, biology, any, any of the core, um, core subjects, they will mm -hmm. be recognized in also, because the, two academic, because the two academical systems are so similar to one another, uh, dual uh, courses will also be accepted. Great. Um, another question we have is, do all universities consider IB and do they use weighted or unweighted GPA? Um, I'll speak to the Canadian uh, side of things. So in terms of IB, if you've taken IB in uh, a full time in English for at least two years, um, then you'll be able to be exempt from uh, the English uh, proficiency test requirement. Um, it won't give you advanced placement in your first semester. Um, for that, you would need to have college level courses and IB for us wouldn't be considered that way, at least at the college level. Um, I do know that some universities will be looking at IB a little bit different and may consider for certain courses um, advanced placement in their first semester. But you really have to look, do, do your research and find the different universities and colleges that you're interested in and see what is their policy around that. Um, and um, I'll briefly also touch on your question about GPA. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, colleges in general in Canada will not be looking at GPA very closely. We just want to make sure that you've graduated either high school if you're looking at an undergrad or you graduated university if you're looking at a graduate program um, successfully. That doesn't mean that you have had to graduate top of your class or with flying colors, but that you did pass all of your courses successfully. Um, and Ilona, if you want to speak to the U.S. experience on that. Uh, yes, I can speak more of the private university perspective uh, on the IB. Um, it is recognized and it will be applied towards um, college level, let's say, English, math, sciences, uh, depending on the IB courses that you have taken, they'll be applied as um, credits towards entry-level college classes uh, or core curriculum classes. Mm -hmm. um, unless the IB has a more specific class, then the registrar office will look at it to see what type of class it might be applied towards to, but it won't go to waste. Um, another thing about the IB is that it gets converted and it gets converted uh, towards, at least in our institution, we convert it on a... Um, uh, weighted and then unweighted, um, sorry, unweighted GPA and then weighted GPA and we take the weighted GPA to calculate your scholarship. So an IB diploma, I'll be honest with you, weighs like a point above what a regular high school diploma would. So it gives you much better chance of getting admitted and getting mm -hmm. a higher scholarship. Another thing like Al Alfredo said, you can use an IB as proof of English proficiency if you actually earn uh, your, your <laughs> IB, um, yes, and especially in the English portion um, of the courses. And would you say, Ilona, that with an IB diploma, are, is, a, is a student able to skip a year or two of university or only, um, you know, get advanced placement on some courses? Advanced placement on some courses. Okay. Um... I don't see any other questions, but maybe we'll give it a couple more minutes and see if anybody's typing anything. Mm -hmm. um, I did want to also mention briefly, um, because you spoke on it too, um, Seneca College's application also has a fee to it. Um, it's usually 90 Canadian dollars to apply. And our application um, allows any student to apply to up to three programs if you're interested in three different programs. Um, which means that you may re uh, receive up to three offers, uh, which then at the time, once you receive your offers, you can then choose which program you actually want to uh, enroll in. Um, now, because you participated or students are participating today um, in this virtual fair with Worldwide College Tours, 
um, anybody who's participating today, um, I will be in touch with after, um, of course, the, the fair and the session, and I will be sharing uh, an application fee waiver code, which you actually mentioned in your, um, in your presentation, so that if you choose to apply to Seneca College, uh, it comes free of charge. Um, so please make sure that, um, you know, if you want to apply, keep an eye out for, for my email. Um, if you have any additional questions that you want to ask privately, I'll be over at my booth very shortly, and I'm sure Ilona will be back at Hearths as well. Um, but I think we have still a few extra minutes um, if anybody wants to shoot us one last question before we sign off. See, I didn't lie about the application. <laughs> no, not know? at all. You actually <laughs> reminded me because I forgot to mention it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the same thing goes for me. Um, I'll be reaching out after the fair, maybe a couple of days later, uh, you know, with an email with uh, application fee waiver code. I mean, for, for JU, generally the application fee is like $30. If you can save yourself $30, I can save myself $30 and buy, you know, ice cream. Why not? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> just, just because you're using um, a school's application fee waiver code, it's not looked upon as, you know, not the same as somebody who submitted the payment for their Exactly. It makes no difference to us. Yeah, and, and for me, generally, it seems like the student did their research. And I mean, in order to, to get the... Um, waiver code you you probably visited the websites or exactly. <laughs> communication with somebody so it's a good thing rather than you know <laughs> all right well it seems like we don't have any other questions coming in Alona so I think we'll wrap it up here um thank you so much to everybody who participated as well as to worldwide college tours and to you Alona as well for being my lovely co-presenter today same thing here. I got the pleasure to work with, with the best panelists and um, it, it was such a pleasure. Thank you thank all you. so much for being with us, listening to us so intensively and thank you to Worldwide College Tours for organizing uh, this presentation and getting us all connected. Perfect. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>